Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's webcast, Build Your Library's Best Case for Data and Analytics, brought to you by Library Journal and sponsored by Gale. This is Josh with Library Journal, just popping in for some quick housekeeping notes before we hand things off to Amanda Winchell with Gale, who will be your moderator today. Uh, so your screen is completely customizable. You can resize any of the windows and move them around, so feel free to adjust as needed to get the most out of your desktop space. If you accidentally close any of the windows, you can bring them back up by clicking on the appropriate widget down at the bottom of your screen. A copy of today's slide deck, as well as a couple of other resources, are available in the resource list window. And you'll be able to download your CE certificate from the certification window once you've met the viewing requirements. You can tweet us at Library Journal with the hashtag, hashtag LJGale. And if you experience any technical difficulties, click on the Help widget where you can find system requirements and FAQs. And if that doesn't resolve your issue, you can send a note through the Q&A window. So with that, I will hand things off to Amanda for today's presentation. Take it away, Amanda. Thanks, Joshua. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Amanda Winchell, and I am the National Sales Manager for Library Analytics for Gale. And I am completely enthusiastic about the panel, the panelists that we have with us today. So without much further ado, I'd like to just start by digging into introductions. Um, Charlie, do you want to start letting us know uh, your name, uh, the, your role at the library, which library, and maybe how long you've been working with data? Sure. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Charlie Burks. I am the Director of Data Analytics and Insights for the Columbus Metropolitan Library. I have been with this library system for going on three years now, and I've been in the data and analytics space for about a decade. Wonderful. Karen or Lynn? Sure, I'll go. My name is Karen Lemke. I'm Head of Marketing and Community Engagement at the Rochester Public Library in Rochester, Minnesota. I have been in my current position for about five and a half years, and um, data is a part of marketing and communications, um, as well as all aspects of library operations. So I feel like I've been doing it here for five years. Prior to being here, I was uh, at the best small library in America in uh, Bayfield, Colorado. So um, in my library experience, I've been doing this for about uh, eight to 10 years. And I'm Lynn Hoffman. I'm the Director of Operations at the Somerset County Library System of New Jersey. Um, I have been a librarian. I was realizing today that I am coming up on my 25th library anniversary. Um, and uh, I've been using data for all of it, um, but I've been specifically in the library, public library data space um, for about six or seven years now. I was on the Public Library Association's evaluation, measurement evaluation and assessment committee. I've been an instructor for Ripple, the Research Institute for Public Libraries, which is all about using data and assessment to make your library great. Um, it's a topic I love, and uh, everybody at my library knows that if there's anything to do with data, I'm the person. Well, that's fantastic. You guys have a lot of uh, experience behind you. So I think, you know, just to let everybody know, our, real, our goal today is to really just have a conversation, right? To have a conversation around data in public libraries and how we can really um, build this data-driven culture that I think libraries are on the precipice of right now. So maybe to start off with, we can maybe just start off talking a little bit about what you see as uh, as the role of data and analytics in public libraries today. Why, why do we need it? Why, why have it at all? Um, Charlie, if you'd like to give us your, your insight. Sure. Um, at the Columbus Metropolitan Library, the one thing that we really try to do is use data to answer questions or discover trends or even confirm or deny hypothesis. Uh, it's not unusual for somebody to approach us and say, hey, we believe this is the case. Can you help us figure out if that's actually the, the truth or not? And I think that's important because all industries are now using data in a much deeper way than we have in probably history. Um, but there's an, a more underlying uh, 
thought behind that. I was listening to a gentleman by the name of Larry Irving. He was a principal architect for the Internet Policy um, Commission under the Clinton administration. And he said something that was very profound. He said, if you have data, you have facts and facts drive policy. In our case, facts drive more than policy. They drive programs, they drive material handling, they try a bit, uh, 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 vendor selection, right? They drive purchasing decisions. So there's so much that we can use our data for in a library setting that it, you almost can't really run an operation without having some level of data to, to kind of assess those decisions. Perfect. Anyone want to add to that? Yeah, I would. I totally agree with everything that you're, you're saying, Charlie. And and for me, you know, I get excited about sharing the data. Uh, you know, so we use them in in very practical, hands-on ways with our annual reports and our infographics. But we're also using them um, using data elements when we're securing funding. Um, when we're you know looking, we like to say that we we like to use the data because it really holds us accountable for all of those strategic decisions and our action plans and helps us to um, really prioritize, uh, you know, new initiatives that we have going on um, at the library. And it also just helps us to fully understand our community rather than really looking and, and relying on our own assumptions that we're making. So um, it, it just is helps us to make sure um, that, like you said, our, our hypotheses are either correct or, or incorrect. Um, and then the other way, which is my favorite way because we're libraries, is it helps us to tell our story and, and put those, those numbers and those facts and those figures behind the story that we're sharing. Yeah, what they said, um, definitely uh, the gut check, um, and I, I find that to be the case a lot of times with staff who um, maybe don't interact with all of the patrons who use a service or a collection or a program. They only hear from the people who are having a problem or who have something to say. And if you only listen to those voices, um, you're not gonna get a complete picture of whether your program or service is, is doing its job. So having some data to be able to confirm that gut reaction um, or to be able to say, you know what, the bigger picture actually looks a little bit different, I think is really helpful. I also mm -hmm. just love um, digging into data and just to see what kinds of things it, it can tell us that maybe we didn't think about before. So um, we've done some work at my library to look at how people use um, our branches, depending on where they live, where they've checked stuff out, where they attend programs. And um, what we know now is that our, our customers move all over the place. Um, that they have neighborhood branches that they use predominantly, but they're not limited just to those neighborhood branches. So um, that helps us make decisions about how to, to manage programs and services. But all of you have a pretty extensive background when it comes to data. You're, you're already sold on it, right? You don't need anybody to talk you into, you know, building this data culture within your organization or anything like that. Um, but obviously not everybody is sitting from that position. You know, if you're already sold on it and you want to help move your organization in that way, how do you do that when you're getting pushback or other individuals don't necessarily share your same philosophy? Any steps or tips and tricks or things things to take? I would love to jump in on that. Yeah. Um, one of the things that that I've realized, and I and I want to say off the bat, like we're not completely there yet at my library. I, I still have, uh, like I'm I'm the data person, but you know there are still folks who are just like I don't know why she's asking us to do this. Um, one one of the things I've observed though is that um, working with data can feel really threatening to to staff sometimes, and and there can be an assumption that you know the data is going to say something and a decision is going to get made that's that's not going to be what I want. So my program, I might find out that it's just not having the outcomes that I want it to have, but I've put my heart and soul into it and I love it. And if I have to stop doing it, what does that mean for me? So part of it is to sort of help. Um, what we've tried to do is to be really specific about how we're going to use the data. Um, so if 
we're looking at program data, we're not evaluating the person who's doing the stuff. We're evaluating the people who are attending it and, and like how are they getting something out of the program. Um, it's a hard thing to overcome though, that, that kind of feeling of, you know, data's gonna tell me something that I don't like about what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. Has that been your experience? Charlie, Karen? Karen, would you like to go? I would, I would, you saw me like, so we're, we're data, van, we're data evangelists, right? I mean, we love the data and we like to get people excited about the data, but we also want to bring everyone along. Um, and at, at Rochester Public Library, we've, we've really worked. I, I feel like that's been what we've done a lot of our, our efforts around is the bringing people along knowing that we have so many more steps to go to to get better data and to improve our data and so i i think i don't know if you'll if you ever feel like you are there yet with your data right it's just this never ending moving target as far as how how um how well you're doing and how 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 much you're doing um but something that we've done um in our library is we actually have um a data wall that serves as our constant reminder that we're all in this together um and we actually have it on display in our um one of our public meeting rooms this is our um used by our library board this is used by community groups pre covid um it's used for programming sometimes it's um it's a very public space we have staff meetings in here um and we take our data and we're sharing our data so that it's not just hidden in a spreadsheet on somebody's laptop somewhere. It is very visible. And I think that's been a really good way for us to, you know, just make sure that it's in our face. I mean, just even going through the the process of updating it on a quarterly basis is, is an activity and is a way that we're um, keeping staff uh, engaged in that. And then we'll use that um, data wall again during normal pre-COVID times, um, highlighting key areas um, uh, uh, or key data elements with our board and with our um, staff members. And it's just been a really great way to, um, again, reiterate that, you know, th these are our, our targets, these are our goals, these are our benchmarks, and and we're we're watching them together. And just a quick follow up question on that, Karen, where is this wall so that everybody can see it? So again, it's in this very public um, space where we host okay. meetings, community groups can use it. Um, we have programs that are happening in this wall, uh, in this space. Um, and and like I said, our, our board meeting every month um, when it's not COVID uh, meets in this room. So it's it's right in the in the middle of the library. So any I want a data member. wall. Yeah. I know everybody should have a data wall. Yeah. <laughs> and for those of you that maybe didn't catch it, but we do have a slide of the picture of Rochester's data wall. So I did put that up um, right now, so you can you can catch that. Um, Charlie, what do you have to add to that? Just that we probably had our most success and. Um, in any data initiative when we can actually partner with one or more departments. Um, that's not always possible. Sometimes you're brought in to do a very specific job or role and you gather your data, you analyze it, you present it and, you know, uh, I'm, we're all used to being questioned on our data or our methods or did you consider this or what about that and, you know, that just comes with the territory. But we really do our best work when we can get with a department or a, a group of people and say, hey, this is what we're trying to do. This is the data we're looking for. This is the, our ultimate goal. We'd love to partner with you on this. And believe it or not, most people are, are more than willing to be a part of the process. And, and, you know, we meet regularly with probably four or five different subgroups or committees on different projects, various projects. And one of the things that brings me gratification is when somebody can see what we've been seeing all along, right? When they can kind of, you can see the light bulbs go off. It's not unusual for somebody to, to say to me, 
hey, you've gotten me really excited, or I'm, I'm, you know, I've got some things I really want to talk to you about because you're inspiring me to do this or to do that, or I'd love to find out, you know, what this looks like. Um, and that's good for us because that helps spread that data message throughout the organization. Perfect. And I just wanted to let everybody know too that we are getting some questions in and some of them we might pop in during this panel discussion, but um, there will be time at the end. So please keep those questions coming in the Q&A. Um, uh, we're gonna get to as many as possible. Um, one of them that just came in is a good segue because it was something that I was gonna ask anyway. And it's kind of part of this pushback question is when you are getting pushback from staff or community members, um, sometimes, or maybe a lot of times, a lot of that is around this topic of privacy. How do you balance privacy um, with really being a data-driven organization? There's this fine line, but I think we'd all really like to hear your guys' viewpoints on that. Um, yeah, so uh, one of the things that um, really attracted us at my library to Gale Engage as a product is the way that it handles patron data. Um, we were looking for a way to be able to draw some conclusions about patron behavior trends. So, for instance, if I check out a lot of ebooks, Am I likely to also check out print materials? Um, so, in order to do that, you have to be able to link together transactions from one uh, within a, a certain patron. Um, and what Engage does really nicely is to anonymize that information in a way that still allows you to make those connections about what a single user is doing um, without having any ties to personally identifiable information. Um, so we'll be able to use that to um, to look at our resources and get a better sense of how people use um, services in our collections sort of across different products um, and, and maybe uh, see some things that we didn't expect or that'll uh, have us make some changes about how we approach collection development, for instance. So, um, yeah, that, that's a really important thing, though. Um, and, and being able to use that information for um, marketing is obviously a really big win. Um, but figuring out what that messaging needs to look like so that people don't freak out about, you know, us like targeting them. <laughs> um, I, I think people are, are much more used to the people who liked what you like also might like this thing. Um, but doing it in a way that still offers people a way out, that gives them a sense of, of security and that we're not, you know, the, the data is only being used to provide the best possible library service that we can. That, that's part of what that messaging is about. Yeah, and to add on that, I, you know, I'm the creepy marketer in the room um, <laughs> with our data team and with our ad administrative team. And I'm, I'm always, you know, looking for the ways to uh, better target um, our audiences and you know and I, I'm also a librarian too I do have my library degree and so I do have that hat of that protection of privacy um, and and uh, there was for a while um, there was some some pushback from our team but as we work more and more um, towards um, equity and to making sure that everyone in our community knows what we have available it, it becomes more and more important to be able to send the right messages um, to the to the people who are interested in those things and to really target our our groups effectively. So about three, maybe four years ago, um, we did move away from an opt in system for our email marketing and um, have have instead gone towards an opt out system for emails. And that has really um, I, I can't tell you, we've used the data um, on our annual customer survey. Uh, we ask people, how are you hearing about information from the library? And they're telling us email, number one across the board. That's how we were able to effectively communicate through this COVID pandemic and get that information out. Um, and we've we've had some some good results, but we know that when we have a targeted email, we have an even greater reach, more people are opening those emails. So um, we see it as a balance of making sure uh, that people are informed. And um, and I think Gage does, um, or, or um, Engage gives us the tool to be much more um, 
targeted and get those messages to the people that are really wanting those messages. So, um, yeah, I know it's it's a fine balance, but we we also know the benefit of of receiving targeted messages. So. We tend to uh, really like the encryption um, process that Engage provides. I'm pretty strict on my team about, you know, we're not sending anybody's data anywhere without some level of protection. So even in addresses, you know, we're looking at Latin long as opposed to a physical address whenever possible. But I do like the encryption, um, that the hashing that Engage provides. It just gives you a sense of security and it allows you to go on and do your work without necessarily worrying about that aspect. Um, you know, as an IT uh, professional, security is always in the forefront of our mind. So at least with a tool like Engage, you can get your data in there. You don't have to worry about the encryption process. You know, it's secure. You can get your data the way you need it. And, and that's just one, one something else you don't have to worry about. Gotcha. Um, now, with, you know, with that privacy question, you guys had all mentioned um, Gail and Gage. And um, each of you has subscribed to either Gale Engage or Gale Analytics in the last handful of months. So it's been pretty, pretty recent. Um, obviously, privacy is really a, a point that sticks out in all of your answers. Was there other criteria or what criteria do you generally use when you are selecting a data tool? What's important? Well, for us, it's go. important to have- Go ahead, oh, Karen, go. It, it, having something um, that can do all of the things. And for us, we were really struggling. Uh, we could get some data with um, some of our surveys. We could get some data that was publicly available. We had tried some other products that would give us um, uh, information, but we were really struggling getting the non-cardholder data. And that's what really attracted us to um, analytics in particular, because that's where we just struggle the most. And we have, we know that not everyone is a card holder, um, sad to say. <laughs> and I'm sure um, many of, of the libraries um, on this webinar today experience the same thing. You know, we've got this, these um, people in our community that could use these resources that we have. How do we reach non um, card holders? So for us, we were looking for something that um, could could get to the non card holders. And so we were interested in, in, um, in analytics, but then we also, we know that we have these relationships with our cardholders. So, so we did both products because we wanted to go all in and, 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 you know, we had nothing better to do this year. Right. Um, <laughs> so for us, it's a, it's a big lift, but it's so important because we really want to understand our users. I mean, this is, this is a, a clear time that um, understanding who is in our community and who our users are and how we can reach them is so critical right now. So yeah. Karen, just to sum that up, um, so if we were gonna say your priorities in a nutshell were patron privacy, understanding your non-users, and then probably being able to understand your users better so you could target market. Would you say that's Absolutely. true? Absolutely, absolutely. Okay. okay. Um, the, Lynn or Charlie? Yeah, the um, the all the things argument uh, resonates for me very much, Karen. Um, we actually had been looking at um, building some some capacity on our staff with with data warehousing um, because what we were struggling with was having data in lots of different silos, um, but not being able to really correlate it together in any meaningful way. Um, so we'd started to do some research about what it might look like for us to build that ourselves, what the cost would be, what it, what it would take in terms of staff knowledge and expertise. Um, and then uh, Engage was in development. Um, and I was like, oh, that is the thing. And, and it does just that. It, it, it can take in data from the ILS, of course, um, but also from things like OverDrive or other databases. It can take in data from our door counters. It can take in data from kind of anything that we want to stick in there. Um, and anywhere we have a library card number, um, that hashing uh, that Charlie talked about um, can connect behavior from one product to another. So that comparison between ebook and print book use, we actually can start to make that um, and, and draw some conclusions about that. 
having all the data in one place is huge. So for you, Lynn, privacy and data centralization. For sure. I'm hearing? Okay, yep. gotcha. And the beauty just, because um, some individuals out there might not be familiar with data centralization or the term of that. Um, in, in a real quick, you know, 20 second blurb, what, what, what's the value of data centralization? Well, it, I think it is that that thing where um, if you if you want to try to take two different silos worth of data and figure out some relationship between them, you can do it with a lot of heavy lifting, a lot of like spreadsheet ninja action, um, and a lot of frustration. Or you can create a system where um, all of that data flows in. Um, to the same place and, and has connections set up between those sources so that you can draw those conclusions more easily. So you can see how the patrons are engaging with the library as a whole versus- Right, right. Yeah, so yeah. just as another example, one of the things that um, that our director always kind of uses as an example is, you know, if, if we're using Communico for, um, a program and event sign up. Um, if we have a patron who really likes all of our history lectures, uh, they might like to know when we get a whole bunch of history materials in because our collection development did a big order. Um, so to be able to look at that and push that information out to them or to be able to see that people who come to our programs use our collection in this way, like that's a, that opens up a new area for us for investigation. Gotcha. Charlie, criteria for you. Um, our biggest was probably the ability to ingest that digital data. You know, I like the, the, that term when you're a hammer, everything's a nail, right? So uh, to resonate back to what Karen was saying, you know, we kind of have the um, analytics on demand or analytics tool that we've used for quite some time. And we did our own um, branch dashboard, which took our transactions from Polaris and kind of normalize those across the different branches so that we could see and compare and contrast uh, how circulation, how visitation's going in different locations. And we hadn't gotten to our electronic data yet. And to Lynn's point, it probably took my team of two, six to seven months to produce the dashboard, which is awesome, we love it but we're looking at another four to five months to get that electronic data in, right? And while we're not as far along as Lynn might be, we're still working through the ingestion process. My guess is it'll take a couple days to get that same electronic yeah. data ingested into that tool that allows us to then see the relationships between uh, our card holders, electronic use versus physical use. And I can tell you that there are some people on my leadership team that are very interested in what that relationship looks like. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. So data centralization and privacy was also another big one for you, Charlie. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, Karen had kind of joked around a little bit about, oh, we had nothing else better to do, right? Um, I'm assuming, you know, we all kind of uh, were flipped upside down over the last year due to the pandemic. How did it or did it at all, the pandemic, play a role in your decision to incorporate new data tools now? Was it a factor? Because I can see it go either way. Some, some might say, listen, we've got too many other things to worry about. I'm not going to start with right. anything new. Otherwise, I could also hear somebody say, you know, now is the time to do it. We need to start connecting with our patrons in a new way. Um, you know, what, what's Absolutely. a better time? So, yeah, what's your guys' feeling on that? So I'll, I'll be completely honest for us. I mean, we had, you know, earmarked our, our marketing budget and then we had nothing nothing, no programming, no, you know, we were, we, we had this funding available and I said, please, we see the effect of this pandemic. We see what is happening uh, in terms of equity. Can we please shift this in an, in this area so that we can better understand who we are reaching and who we are not reaching and make this investment because it's an investment, but it's an investment that 
you know, we can't, <laughs> you talked about, you know, doing your Excel magic, but you have to have the people that can do the Excel magic right. and that can do the, um, you know, mapping and, and research all of the different sources that are all together. And so for us, it, it was like, of course, this is, this is the time to do this. Karen, you had also, I think, mentioned previously when we were talking about, I'm not going to get it right, but um, did you guys hire a consultant and it kind of helped to give you various steps? To yes. I, so we like were... Yeah, we were really fortunate to work with Wilder Research um, on our strategic planning process. And so in 20, you know, years ago, um, we we worked with them on developing a logic model for our library to, you know, we had our strategic plan in place and we knew we wanted to do some outcomes measurement, but we couldn't like we couldn't figure out how to get from here to here. You know, we needed that, um, you know, we, we knew what our goals were, but we, we really needed like that, that process in place. And so um, this is the, the logic model that uh, Wilder helped us develop. And it really um, it just made it so that we could see the map. You know, we, we knew we needed to go somewhere, but we didn't know how we were going to get there. And so having this logic model really um, keeps us kind of on the same path where we're not going off in different directions. Um, and we're holding ourselves accountable by taking those short-term outcomes. And that's what you saw on our data wall. Those short-term outcomes are being measured and we have them up in a very public space. And so um, it was really great to work with Wilder. Um, and we're actually um, looking at ways that we could potentially work with them in the future because we we just know um, how valuable it was to have an outside entity help us through this process. Um, and so one of our first steps um, in, in using the, the Gale products is actually building some kind of dashboard of, of who we are. And, and I know I will be picking Charlie's brain much more because it sounds like he's already, he's already done this work so he can give us some great insight. Um, so yeah, we're, we, we know that we have um, more work to do in, uh, in getting that um, up because it, it's amazing how the you know what the value is of of seeing things on on paper and having having something written out to just like a strategic plan to keep us all um, headed in the right direction. Gotcha, Lynn or Charlie, do you have anything to add in regards to the timing of your decision and whether or not the pandemic played a role? For us, it really didn't. Um, per se, we already were on the hunt for um, this sort of centralized data aggregation and analysis tool. Um, we kind of turned, put it on the back burner a little bit while we were kind of trying to create a whole new service model for the public library, um, but then picked it back up again in the fall. And, and one of the things that I think um, it's going to help us do that we've been talking about is, is think about, you know, what are the key performance indicators that we want to pay closer attention to? So um, we've traditionally looked a lot at, at physical circulation. Um, that is kind of meaningless if you're close to the public and not doing curbside for several months and there's no physical circulation to look at. Um, so being able to look more at things like um, like cardholder retention and how often people use their cards for all of the things, checking out physical materials, accessing databases, um, signing up for programs, and, and looking at um, how many people did something in the last three months or the last six months as a way to measure our engagement with our community um, differently uh, than we had previously. So the timing is great, um, but I, I think it, we would have done it anyway. I can tell you that timing was really important for us. Um, the way I understand it, our data team of two plus me is actually pretty large in this space, although I would yep. advocate for more people if at all possible, if anybody's listening. Um, but we were already stretched thin um, in the midst of COVID. We were doing social vulnerability studies. We were looking at unemployment data. We were trying to help figure out, you know, what processes we could still um, monitor and measure and, and, and we could deliver in the midst of the pandemic. 
Um, and like most people, we were in various states of opening or reopening. And, you know, we had just rolled out our big dashboard. And now we were asking, being asked to do two more dashboards. And, you know, any additional help in this space is, is truly valuable. So to know that there was another tool out there that we could leverage that took some of the weight off of us trying to do that work manually made all the sense in the world. Gotcha. Um, so kind of um, in summary, if somebody had said to you, I'm trying to build a culture of data in my organization, in one or two minutes, if each of you could just give your biggest piece of advice on how to do that or the mindset to take, please share. So my my best piece of advice for getting started is to um, to figure out who your allies are, um, and you can do that in a couple different ways. Hopefully, you've got someone in your administration, uh, your director, or someone else who is already on board, who who's been sold on the whole idea, because um, that kind of support is really useful. Um, but to just kind of get a sense of like, who's really good at spreadsheets? Who really likes to look at census demographic data? Who, who are the people who can help you be, help you cheerlead for it out in your organization? Um, and then to find something to examine that's going to make everybody feel good as kind of a first step. So, um, if you can choose something that, that's pat on the back-ish. So um, one of the very first ways that we used project outcome in my library was uh, looking at summer reading program. Um, and that was like a no-lose situation because we knew we were going to get lots of feedback that said, you know, this has been really helpful and it's made a difference in the literacy skills of my children. That's a wonderful place to start because it makes everybody feel like, oh, this is, this is good. This is going to tell us um, how, how well we're doing our job. Great. I echo a lot of what a lot of what you're saying. Um, I I agree. It really um, you got to have that leadership on board. Um, and and for us, I I feel really fortunate that our leadership team has been on board throughout this process and is you know really makes this a priority. Um, but at the same time. Um, it really needs to include everyone. So everybody needs to have some part in it, whether it's, you know, helping in the distribution of surveys, whether it's helping craft any, you know, tangible infographics or or giving ideas of other ways to share. Because there's a, there's a no part where you're knowing and learning about your community, but then there's also the show part where you're sharing those um, outcomes and those measurements and making sure that, that your community is, is um, is hearing about the, what what you're learning, um, and so we um, really work on having those like tangible ways. You know, I mentioned the data wall, mentioned the logic model. We have physical, you know, logic models printed for everyone that they can have at their desk to always refer to. Uh, we don't hide that we're using a logic model. We make sure that we're uh, mentioning it over and over again, um, and and so really getting getting everybody on board, whether it is, you know, futzing with the spreadsheet or it is um, giving feedback on the latest survey, um, wherever we can engage, you know, new teammates in that process, it's, it's really, uh, really valuable because it, it, it shouldn't be, um, it should be as, as common as, as the books that we have in our libraries, that everyone is in some way involved in the, in the process of, of of getting, you know, learning and, and sharing data. Charlie? For, for us, um, our leadership was already bought in. Um, I think if I can, if I can be a little careful here, I think we had a hard time convincing some of our, our um, departments. Um, I think somebody mentioned earlier, nobody wants some, a, the data person digging around in their backyard, right? <laughs> Um, for a number of reasons, even though we're here to help. Uh, so one of the things that, that made sense for us when we first started um, is we looked for those uh, quick wins. You know, we looked for the low hanging fruit, right? We developed uh, partnerships with individuals, kind of like Len said, you know, the people that enjoy the spreadsheets or, cause you know, as soon as you stand up a data department, you get everybody loves data, but that's not really the case, right? But you can easily find those people that you can partner with to, 
to then build relationships with. And one of the great things about what we do at CML is we have people in other areas that regularly partner with my team members. Um, so it's help in this area, it's help on that analysis, or can you get this data for me? And, and that allows our influence to spread throughout the organization. Perfect, gotcha. Um, so to sum it up then, basically finding your allies, trans and I think the common theme is transparency, right? And getting everybody involved, because if you try to you know, do it behind their back, even if that's not intentional, obviously, um, people are wondering what's going on. So being completely transparent about what you want to do and the, obviously the value that it brings, not just to the organization, but to their department or to them individually, right, will help get them, get them on board. Um, so from here, I think what we'll do is uh, Gale Analytics and Gale Engage were mentioned a few times. So I'm just going to take a few minutes to describe to everybody um, really what those tools are so that um, everybody has a little bit of context. And then what we'll do is start thinking about, I'm talking to the audience now, start thinking about um, what are some of your takeaways? What were, what were some of the things that you have learned um, from what these three individuals have said? And put those in the chat. Um, if you use the chat, everybody can see that. Um, the entire audience can. If you put them in Q&A, only the panelists can see it. So if you have a question, go ahead and put that in the Q&A. Um, if you want to share what it is that you, you've learned thus far from this presentation, please put that in the chat, and I think we'll feature some of those um, a little bit later on. So to kind of go into, just to take a minute with um, what Gale Analytics is to start, because that's been mentioned a few times, is Gale Analytics really allows a library to take one data set. It could come from anywhere, um, but the minimum that's needed is really a, a, an address, right? And that information is uploaded into the tool and is married with the external information that Gale provides. And that information is census data, American community survey data, demographic, geographic, and Experian lifestyle data. These two data sets come together and are married based on the common denominator being that, being that address. And so what happens then is that uh, data is processed and then it comes back to you, the library. Nobody else has access to it. Gail doesn't, uh, no third party does. That information comes back to you in the form of a Tableau dashboard. That Tableau dashboard then you can use um, you know, you know, it's almost sky's the limit with that thing. Um, it, you've got basically charts in there. You've got maps in there. You you can create mailing lists. You can use filters to drill down into um, you know various demographics, various groups. You can understand the lifestyle characteristics. But I think the biggest thing to understand with Gale Analytics is it's really giving you a view of who your patrons and non-patrons are outside the library who they are as an American consumer is, is how I like to put it. So think of Gale Analytics as a really deep view of who your community members are, patrons and non-patrons outside the library. Now, when it comes to Gale Engage, that was the second tool that was mentioned today. Um, Gale Engage uh, really complements Gale Analytics in the sense it really gives you a deep view of what's happening in the library. As Lynn, um, so adequately described, Gale Engage really centralizes data. So it takes data from could be ILS, OverDrive, you know, Hoopla, program, door counts, Wi-Fi, what, basically whatever it is that you want. It takes all that data and it aggregates it, right? And so when it centralizes it or it aggregates it, it allows you as the library to really understand how your patrons are interacting with you holistically. Um, so instead of just interacting or understanding how they're working with or interacting with this vendor and this vendor and this vendor, right? Because all of those that data is in silos right now, it combines it all so that you can see how the uh, how your patrons are interacting with you as a whole. With that centralized data, then it really allows you then to or allows the tool to create automatic visualizations so that you are more apt to take action on the data. And then it also allows for target marketing because with the centralization, groups are automatically created so that if you have a, I don't know, a mystery novel or author that's coming in to do a program, for example, you can reach out specifically to those mystery enthusiasts. 
um, instead of sending one blanket message to everybody out there that may or may not be interested in it. Um, we're in a day and age right now where target marketing is vitally important because we've got an attention span just like in a matter of seconds, right, as consumers. And so if that message doesn't appeal to us in a split second, we're going to uh, disregard it, we're going to delete it, or we're going to unsubscribe. And that's the last thing that we, uh, we want to happen. So really, Gale Engage allows us to do that target marketing component based upon library behavior. The third component of it that was mentioned um, significantly throughout today's discussion was the privacy aspect. So in addition to the automatic visualizations and the centralization and the target marketing, all of the patrons, uh, patron ID uh, is anonymized. So you have no idea, even as the library, who you're sending targeted um, marketing messages to because everything is anonymized and encrypted. So that, that in information is not even available. Um, so to kind of summarize that, Gale Engage really helps you to understand how your patrons are interacting with you as a library as a whole instead of individual data silos. And then finally, when we put these two tools together, Gale Engage and Gale Analytics, it really gives us the inside the library view with Gale Engage and the outside the library view with Gale Analytics and really then allows you to understand your patrons and your non-patrons and how, how, you know, who your community is and how they're potentially um, not just interacting with you, but then also how you can connect with them. Um, that's really how these two tools work together. So with that, um, if we could maybe um, start putting some things in the chat box right now, um, we can take a look at what, what you know, what everybody has gotten or come away with this, uh, with this conversation. So feel free to, to do that. And in the meantime, while hopefully the, the chat box is filling up, we're gonna address some of these questions that have come through the Q&A as well. Um, Lynn, I know you had sent a message about wanting to address a couple of questions. Uh, do you want to, um, do you want to start with those? Oh, I think you're I'm, on mute. I unmuted Lynn. myself. Okay. There we go. Um, so there were a couple of questions as I was scrolling through that kind of jumped out at me. Um, there was a question a while back from um, John um, at Northern Kentucky University about uh, handling post patron satisfaction surveys. Um, I mentioned um, early on um, project outcome, which was a, a, a project by the Public Library Association um, to look at outcome related um, data about programs and services. And there is actually an academic version of that as well. I'm going to stick that link in the chat. Um, it's definitely worth a look. It gives you a good um, validated standardized set of questions to look at impact of, of programs and services. So that's one. Um, there's also a question about library size. Um, and yes, we all are from large uh, or medium to large libraries. Um, and that doesn't mean that you have to have a data department like Charlie does um, or a top marketing professional like Karen is uh, to be able to take advantage of this stuff. Um, there are lots and lots of tools out there that are available for, um, for free or for very, very low cost, especially if you go through like TechSoup or something. Um, it does require that you sort of bone up on your data knowledge and skills, um, but there's also lots of great free training resources out there. And I'm going to put a bunch of links in the chat because I'm a librarian and I want to cite my sources. Uh, so there are three things here. One is the Research Institute for Public Libraries, um, Ripple. Um, Info People and Web Junction, all three of them have great resources for learning how to use data and evaluation and assessment in your library. And then the third thing that I would say really quickly um, is uh, thinking about Engage, we're going to use it and, and we're going to do stuff with the data ourselves. And we, we have a marketing department and a fantastic director of marketing. Um, but if you're a small library and you don't have that staff, a product like Engage can um, give you some of that um, kind of expertise and insight without having to have the body in the building to do that work for you. Um, so a lot of what um, Karen has been doing at Rochester 
uh, up until you know now they're they're getting into engage she's she's been applying her skills and expertise to the data that they have um, if you don't have that there you you can kind of hire out for that at a rate that's going to be cheaper than actually having the person on your staff so um, it's definitely worth looking at especially if you look at it kind of through that lens the the value of that marketing and outreach that you get for it Perfect. And maybe it would just benefit everybody if we could just each go around and give the size of our uh, service areas or pop. Sure. 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 Uh, Somerset County Library System, we're 10 branches and we serve about 190,000. And we're Rochester Public Library with, again, that single branch location and a bookmobile, and we serve about 150,000. Uh, Columbus Metropolitan Library has a one main library. 22 additional branches. I am not going to guess on how, what our patron size looks like. I have some numbers, but I'm not sure that they're 100% accurate. I will say that Columbus, Ohio has a population of about 1.6 million. Now we're not the only library system in that area, but we are the largest. Okay. And Karen, the system that you came to before, that was smaller. Wasn't it, or am I mistaken? That, on that? was super small. So yes, okay. best small library in America, um, Pine River Library, Bayfield, Colorado. Thank you for the shout out. Still love, <laughs> still love my my old library. Um, that was much smaller. So the population, I want to say, it was roughly ten thousand card holders. So much smaller, and I and I get it. So that that question resonated with me because I, it is a, such a completely different um, world. Um, I know when I was at um, my library in Colorado, a lot of time spent doing double duty where you're working the desk and and, and doing marketing and, and working on um, those things uh, while you're also, you know, working the desk and might need to go shovel snow later. I mean, it's a very different world. So, but, it, but not the world that Charlie's living in with, um, with some data people. So for us, I mean, right. we're really doing a lot of things where we're kind of figuring things out on our own and maybe making some sis mistakes and learning along the way of, of what works and what doesn't work. We have developed a, a standard set of um, questions that we are using year after year and, and making sure that we're recording our methodology which we weren't doing maybe five years ago, but we're doing now. So um, I think that was something that I didn't mention earlier that I wanted to mention was, um, you know, give yourself a little grace to to learn along the way, because sometimes you'll you'll think, oh, this is an amazing survey that I'm putting out and it gives you nothing that is helpful. <laughs> and that's OK, because you learn from it and you get better from it and uh, then can apply that. Um, but then having a vetted tool for us was really important because we know this can take us to the next level. So um, very excited to, to be using this more and, and I'm sure making mistakes along the way here as well, but again, <laughs> learning and growing because that's, that's what we want to do. That's how we get better. Right, absolutely. Um, Charlie, what was that quote that you said in the beginning and who was it? If you have data, you have facts and facts drive policy. Um, Larry Irving. Uh, Larry okay. Irving is a, uh, he's kind of a, uh, uh, for us old IT guys, um, an, an internet guru. Um, but yes, his quote was, if you have uh, data, you have facts and facts drive policy. Perfect. Somebody asked that. Um, okay. Also, another question here for anybody. Have any of the speakers engaged in data training for staff? Why, yes. Yes, yes I have. <laughs> What do you want to know? <laughs> um, I think maybe uh, sometimes I get a question on that. Like, is it is it valuable? What do staff need to know? Are they interested in it? Um, is this part of the process of getting people engaged and you know um, and to have that buy in with data? Any? Mm -hmm. It was a general question. So anything you want to add? Yeah. I will say, I mean, so I have done done data training, stuff that's about specific tools or specific methods. But I think the thing that's even more important is to um, try to get the same message out to everybody about why we're even doing in this in the first place. Um, and what I always try to frame it in terms of is, so what? Like we're so we're providing this service. 
what are we expecting to happen as a result? What, what's going to happen in the lives of our community members if they attend this program? Why are we doing this thing? Um, and if you can start with that, um, that helps you to uh, figure out which things you need to measure in order to find out whether or not you're, you're successful. So like the big thing that I emphasize in training is knowing figuring out why you're doing the thing is often the first point in um, taking that data journey. Gotcha. Um, we've got another question here. It says, what is the minimal amount of and most essential personnel for building a public library data analytics team? One. Um, <laughs> One. I, 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 just tongue in cheek, I would say the minimum amount is zero. Um, you just have to find someone who wants to do it, but that's not really a team, is it? Charlie, you go. <laughs> no, um, you're you're really, really close to what I was going to say, Lynn. You need one person. You need one person who's committed, right? And your team doesn't have to be a traditional team. You can always use, um, I can't use the term virtual because that means something else right now than it used to, but you could do some sort of soft team where you can borrow someone from every department that wants to be a part of an initiative. And you start by having coffee and talking about what data you have and what data you don't have and what data you need and that project somebody asked you about that you just can't seem to get to. And that conversation snowballs into bringing in a sponsor or a leader or somebody in the organization who might be willing to put a little bit of money behind an initiative like that. Or you bring in a professional from an or another organization that can help kind of help guide you in that direction. Um, but I think starting small, especially for small libraries, that's going to be important, but you just got to be committed. It was interesting for us. So we started with two, myself and a colleague, you know, whenever, when we said, you know, we're going to be working with these products, everyone was on board, but they were like, this is your thing. Um, and then once we started talking about um, this work that we were going to be doing, all of a the sudden there were others that were like, Ooh, that, that kind of sounds interesting. Can, can, can I get invited to that party? So now we actually have a, a data team of um, six of us that are meeting. Then we've got our two, myself and my colleague that are, are working as kind of the, the leads, shared leads of this team. But we're, um, we have a, a group of six that want to be involved, which is fantastic because, again, we want that buy-in as we keep going along. Um, but it also gives us um, a small enough group that there's some consistency because, you know, it keeps can get, um, it, it, I wouldn't want a group of 30, let's say. I, I want 30 um, ambassadors who are behind and excited about it, but I, I could see it being challenging working through the data with, with a, a large group. So I think a nice, small, manageable group is a good group. Gotcha. Um, and we probably only have time for maybe one more question. Um, Charlie, could you share some examples of data gathering projects that your library cooperated with other municipal departments on? Um, sure. We worked with um, a group called Morpsey, a Mid Ohio Planning, uh, Mid Ohio Regional Planning Commission. Um, they do a lot of development and transportation studies and provide data in those areas. So we regularly go to them for service area projections and population projections. We work with uh, Franklin County Public Health um, to get information on our vulnerability studies. We work with our Workforce Development Board to get unemployment data. Uh, we've worked with at least one author on our computer use in, in neighborhoods as that author is doing a larger piece for a publication. So, you know, we're very careful. We only really provide aggregated data. We don't provide any patron data or anything that's, that's questionable. Um, but if there's a need or an opportunity to serve the community, we're always willing to partner. Perfect, thank you. So just wanted to um, mention some of the um, takeaways here. Um, making the process transparent, that was one. Um, organization will always be growing and making mistakes. The term data centralization is really key. Enjoy all the terminology. Um, the ripple, uh, you know, Lynn had mentioned ripple, so that's a key component here as well too, uh, and so on and so forth. So 
anyway, I wanted to thank everybody. We just have about uh, probably 30 seconds left or so. I wanted to thank uh, everybody for attending and certainly wanted to thank all of our panelists here. Um, you guys were awesome and I really enjoy working with all of you. Um, and I believe at this time, I also need to hand this back over to Joshua if you are available. Hey, Nana. Thank you. Uh, and thanks to all of our panelists for uh, joining us today and delivering an awesome presentation. Uh, this webcast will be archived and you'll get an email to let you know when it's available for the on-demand recording. Uh, it's usually in about 24 hours. And you can find this webcast and other archive and upcoming webcasts in the events and PD section at libraryjournal.com. Thanks everyone, bye-bye.